Good morning, everyone. Today, Secretary French will give us an update on schools. Secretary Smith will talk about vaccines. And Dr. Levine will give us his health update. To start, those uh, who are 75 and older, if you haven't gotten an appointment as yet uh, for the vaccine, there's still time. Uh, there are still plenty of time slots available. The website and phone number uh, will be up on the screen behind me, and we'll leave it up uh, during the briefing so that you can call if you'd like to. There it is. Now, we've, uh, we've been very clear about why we're using a vaccine by age strategy, uh, because the science and data uh, is real. The older you are, the more likely you are to die if you contract this virus. I've heard concerns and comments from some who wonder, why can't we vaccinate younger people first, those who are out and about? Can't those who are older just stay home? And look, I understand how anxious everyone is and how anxious they are for everything to get back closer to normal. But we feel strongly that our goal should be reducing hospitalizations and deaths rather than prioritize lower risk groups. First, preservation of life must be our top priority. That's why we've taken the measures we have over the last 10 months. And I hope everyone understands <clears throat> this virus isn't just a common cold. We've seen over 400,000 Americans lose their lives to this. Vaccinating those most at risk first will not only save lives and prevent our hospitals from being over, overwhelmed, but this will allow us to open up our economy quicker too. Because we can't wait for herd immunity to ease restrictions and get back to normal again. And if we protect those who are most at risk, we can end the state of emergency faster. Now, don't get me wrong. Masks and distancing will still be with us for a while, but with a strategy focused on limiting hospitalization and death, we can both open up more and keep people safe. And remember, every dose diverted from the most vulnerable will only prolong our return to more normal times. Second, <clears throat> I want Vermonters to think about what it's been like since March for our parents grandparents and elderly friends and how much they've sacrificed. Like 83-year-old Nancy Stevens, who shared a story with Vermont Digger this week, Nancy was able to get her first dose on Wednesday, the day our, our clinics opened uh, to those 75 and older. According to Digger, Nancy lives in East Hardwick and has been staying in her home for the past 11 months. She's followed the guidance skip Thanksgiving and Christmas gatherings, and hasn't even met her great-grandchild who was born this past year. When she got her vaccine yesterday, she told Digger, and I quote, it's been tough. I miss my family. I used to go places and do things with my family and friends almost every day. I'd like very much to be able to be free again. I hear similar stories all the time and I know how hard this has been. In fact, I haven't been able to see my own mom in over a year. And by the way, she's been trying to sign up to get her vaccine in Florida for the last month and just texted me this morning with the good news. She has an appointment next Tuesday. We know those who are older are more vulnerable and they've always been there for us, each and every one of us. Now it's our turn to be there for them. With that, I'll turn it over to Secretary French. Secretary French. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'll begin my update with a review of our surveillance testing data for the last two weeks, since I didn't give a report on this uh, data last week. We've been conducting the weekly PCR surveillance testing for school staff since mid-November. Uh, the testing is voluntary, and we see about 40% of staff uh, participating in the testing each week. For the week of January 17th, uh, we had a participation rate of 41% with two positive cases. Uh, this translates to a positivity rate of 0.08%, uh, which remains significantly lower than the state positivity rate of 2%. Uh, 
This week, we had a participation rate of 39%, or about 2,200 tests. Um, and to date, we have not had any cases from this week's testing. The data from our surveillance testing has been useful to monitor conditions for the virus around the state. We do not use the surveillance testing data in our decision making around vaccine prioritization. The prioritization of vaccination is largely driven by the very limited supply of vaccines. We do think the surveillance testing is a very important tool and intend uh, to continue to use it in the coming months. The data from the testing is just one indicator that helps us understand the conditions of the virus in both our schools and our communities. We can use the data to help inform any changes we might need to make in our guidance to ensure the safety of our schools. I do think these data show that we continue to operate our schools very safely. We have cases of virus in our schools, uh, but the mitigation measures used by school staff show we can contain the spread of the virus when it does occur. The dedication of our EPI team at the Department of Health and their close collaboration with school staff, such as our school nurses, are key ingredients for the success in containing the virus. Implementing these mitigation systems in our schools will remain a priority in the coming months, even as we deploy more vaccine, and will remain a priority as we put more emphasis on recovery efforts in education. I thought I'd give an update on some other things we are working on relative to guidance in our schools. We have not made a decision yet on whether we would permit competitions and games for winter sports. We continue to monitor our epi data very closely in this regard. Not enough time has passed, however, to understand the impact of expanded practices and team-based scrimmages on COVID cases and the required quarantines. Throughout the pandemic, we've been struggling with developing guidance uh, for music in schools. Uh, there are some aspects of music that are inherently more risky than other activities but we remain committed to trying to find a path forward in music. We will be having a meeting on February 9th with music teachers and our health experts to review next steps for music. Lastly, uh, we've been working on our approach to the mandatory state assessments. In Vermont, we use the Smarter Balance Assessment or what we call the SBAC. Last year, the federal government waived the requirement for states to administer these tests because of the COVID-19 emergency. We've been waiting to see how the Biden administration will be addressing the requirement for mandatory assessments. Meanwhile, uh, we've been evaluating our options. Because there are a lot of logistics behind this decision, we'll be providing an update on our approach later in February. The tests are normally administered in May. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Secretary French. As of today, over 48,000 Vermonters have received vaccines. 32,952 Vermonters received their first dose and 15,400 their second dose. As of last evening, we have now registered 32,556 Vermonters, 75 years old or older, who are scheduled for their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine over the next five weeks. We, as I mentioned, we anticipate, uh, anticipate finishing the first dose of this age group in five weeks. Looking out further, um, we anticipate having the first three age bands, that's 75 years old and older, 70 years old and older, and 65 years old and older done with their first dose by the end of the winter or beginning of spring, and many will have received their second dose as well. We use the first dose to calculate when we can begin to move to the next phase. That tells us how many new people we can vaccinate with the vaccine allotment that we get from the federal government. You know, several press conferences ago, someone asked me about my end of the winter, beginning of spring prediction for having first doses completed for the three age bands. And by the way, many of the second doses completed too. I said middle to end of March, and I still feel comfortable in providing that uh, time frame. In addition, I have not included in any of these calculations any new vaccines that may come to the market or any increase in doses coming from the federal government. Obviously, this would accelerate the time frame. Speaking of additional doses, 
This week, we received an additional 1,350 first doses of the vaccine. This is above and beyond our regular allocation. Our priorities for the additional allocation are increased appointments in counties that have limited appointments for ages 75 and above. That includes Orange, Bennington, and Lamoille counties. Vulnerable populations, which include BIPOC community and individuals in the 1A grouping. We hope to receive 10,375 doses for the next two weeks. We will work to add vaccination sites to areas where there are longer drive times and, um, and the homebound and continue to allocate vaccines to Group 1A healthcare workers. We will also keep a small reserve on hand uh, to respond to any emerging issues. Last week, to facilitate the transition from Group 1A to Phase 2, the, major the majority of the vaccine allocation was for Vermonters age 75 and older. As we transitioned to Phase 2, we asked hospitals to use quantities they had in stock first. And in future weeks, we would continue to provide vaccine allocations to complete the 1A group, albeit in smaller amounts than when phase 1A began. Unfortunately, some Vermonters took that to mean that we are no longer providing vaccines for the 1A grouping. This is not the case. We will continue to provide vaccines for those in 1A. Although there may be some who have, um, who have, may have been vaccinated that didn't fall into the definition of 1A. Looking at the program in total through the hospital program, we believe that the majority of vaccine re recipients, in fact, did meet the qualifications. We are continuing to work with hospitals to ensure clarity on who is included in Group 1A, and we are providing screening tools to help them determine who should be included. As I have mentioned before, and I just want to mention again, um, we have no waiting list for extra doses. However, we are striving to prevent wasted doses in this vaccination program. There are lists of people that we maintain who are eligible for vaccines. This includes lists of eligible Vermonters 75 years and older that have registered for vaccines, 1A Vermonters that are eligible and, and homebound um, uh, 75 plus that, that are eligible as well. These are the priority groups that we will call if there are extra doses at the end of the day. However, the prime objective is to prevent wasted doses. And if, as a last resort, a vaccine has to be administered to a person not eligible in order to prevent waste, local health clinics have been given the permission to use Vermont common sense and fairness in not wasting doses. As I mentioned, in, res in response to increased demand in certain counties, we have added appointments in Bennington, Orange, and Lamoille County. We continue to work with Grand Isle County to finalize and add appointment sites. We also are encouraging the call center and all other individuals who are assisting people with registration to make sure that all available locations are considered, including kidney drug, kidney drug operating sites. Each night, we monitor the appointments available at each site, and although some sites are beginning to fill up, there are still openings in every county across the state. It may not be at a date and time that you wish, uh, but there are still openings, and if one fills up, we will expand and react to uh, anything, any county that fills up. As I have mentioned previously, there have been only a few bumps along the road as we implemented this statewide vaccination program. But as I said on Wednesday, so far, this statewide registration and vaccination process has been a success. And I think you've seen that uh, from the reaction of the public. This success is the result of many people including, as I mentioned before, many state employees across multiple departments and agencies, our health partners, uh, neighbors and friends who 
helped, gave a helping hand to those folks to get scheduled. I just have to say a th big thank you to all of them. Again, it is important to emphasize we are vaccinating older Vermonters first to prevent death. That's plain and simple. As the governor said, over 70% of Vermont's COVID-19 deaths have been among Vermonters 75 and older, and more than 90% among age 65 and older. We have an obligation, and as I've said before, we have a moral obligation to prevent Vermonters from dying. In addition, as the governor mentioned, think about this since last March, our seniors have been some of the hardest hit during this pandemic in terms of isolation. If we can reduce the number of people who have severe illness, who are dying, who may be also hospitalized, this positions us to begin to return to normal much earlier than if we take our limited amount of vaccine and prior prioritize those who are at very little risk of severe illness, complications, or death. I would urge those Vermonters 75 years old and older who have not done so to go ahead and register for your vaccine. Please do so by going online at the Health Department's website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or call our registration call center at 855-722-7878. Lastly, on Wednesday, we made a game time call on what to report to you at this press conference on the situation at Springfield Hospital. Just moments before we walking into this uh, press conference, both Dr. Levine and I got a text informing us about a situation at Springfield Hospital, hospital regarding the Moderna uh, vaccine being stored there and that vaccination clinics had been canceled. We could have done one of two things, not mention it at the press conference or disclose it with everything that we knew at the time. We chose transparency and I read directly from a text that I received, including that the standing recommendation from the manufacturer is to waste doses in this situation. But I also said that VDH was investigating me, uh, investigating. Uh, believe me, the last I wanted to report was news that we may have to waste 860 doses of COVID-19 vaccine, especially when we had such a good track record of minimizing dosage loss. But I thought it was important to be upfront with what we knew at the time. As Dr. Levine will report, we have some good news about vaccines at Springfield Hospital. But I know the situation caused some confusion, which is often the case in breaking news situations. I apologize for any confusion, but I am pleased that we'll be able to report, be able to use uh, most of these doses. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. Just for a very quick uh, update, and then I'm going to speak a little bit about colleges, speak about the doses you just uh, were informed about, and a little more on vaccine. Cases in Vermont really remain at steady levels, between 78 and 133 cases in the past three days. Most importantly, our seven-day average continues to trend slightly downward in the low 130 range. We continue to have a very favorable percent positivity rate of 2.2%. Deaths continue to increase at a much lower rate. We believe this has something to do with the fact that there have been less cases of COVID in long-term care facilities in the month of January than in the month prior and hence less, less opportunity for death in these populations. That is indeed good news. There has been an uptick in hospitalizations. Yesterday's report was 59 hospitalized patients. 
there's been a slight delay in my getting the numbers from this morning. Um, and if I get them during the conference, I'll report them out. We continue to very closely monitor the colleges and universities as students return. As I mentioned on Wednesday, we're seeing more cases through testing when students first arrive and again seven days later. A number of athletic teams have had outbreaks and had their seasons paused, including UVM, Castleton, and Norwich. Because it's been in the news, Norwich University is where I'll start. It's reported now over 80 cases. This is a situation we're following very closely and we're reviewing existing infection control protocols and prevention strategies. We believe much of the initial impact was from students traveling from many other parts of the country, perhaps not quarantining first, adding in the risk of travel, and in some cases, students learned on their arrival here that family members from back home had tested positive. We are working very closely with Norwich to refine testing protocols, especially for close contacts, on top of the surveillance testing that's already in place. Examine case location and potential spread on campus to, gu to guide us in facility recommendations and review their quarantine housing protocols and where needed, provide state support. Now we've heard anecdotally from the colleges about faster spread of the virus, more students with symptoms than in the fall, but we don't yet have data on whether this is the result of any difference in the virus itself. We projected the return for the spring semester would reveal more active case numbers than in the fall, knowing how much more virus activity has been happening throughout the country and the region. We are in the process of submitting specimens from cases for genomic sequencing to see if any of these college cases involve the new variants. I won't have further information on that till sometime next week, as it's not as rapid a turnaround as a PCR test would be. Now, though these cases are concerning, this is exactly why we require returning college students to be tested and quarantined. This helps us identify cases, ensure they isolate themselves, and that their close contacts quarantine before the semester even begins. This allows school to start safely and helps protect the surrounding communities. As they did in the fall, the University of Vermont is doing some testing prior to the student even leaving home through saliva testing. And on a very positive note, we have results thus far from 6,521 students with only 15 positives for a positivity rate of 0.25%. Early data from Champlain College also reveals only a few cases that are positive at this point in time. So these are very uh, promising good news and again uh, validate the reason why we do this in the first place, to enable our colleges to return to their semester with safety of their campus and their communities in mind. Now, moving to Springfield. Many of you heard, as the Secretary was just talking about, uh, at our press conference about information we received relating to concerns about the temperature of some vaccine doses at Springfield Hospital. We've been notified that its refrigerated vaccine may have reached a temperature slightly above the manufacturer's recommended maximum, and I mean slightly, a little over one degree centigrade. The general guidelines Moderna provided to all of the states indicated that in that situation, the doses may need to be discarded. And indeed, preliminary communications with the company seemed very consistent with that. But because of the very large amount of vaccine involved, 860 doses, and the specifics of the situation, we, along with hospital officials, worked with the company on a much more comprehensive review. Late yesterday afternoon, 
Moderna informed me and the health department that all of the vaccine doses are indeed effective and safe for use. They determined none of the doses were impacted by temperature inconsistencies and all could be used with full public confidence. Fortunately, none of the vaccine had been discarded as we waited for these results. I'd like to emphasize that the conclusion was based on a deeper review of all of the facts. We want the public to know that they can have confidence in the vaccine and in Springfield Hospital. We appreciate the hospital's proactive efforts in alerting us about the situation and working with us during this review. You should know that our immunization program, which provides vaccination guidance and support for the state's healthcare providers, continues to work with Springfield Hospital to investigate the storage issues. They plan to conduct a site visit today, something that we commonly do in the immunization program. Though we always work to minimize what's called non-viable doses or wastage, it does happen in the world of vaccination, and I said this at the last press conference as well. Luckily in Vermont, we have had a very low number of COVID-19 vaccine wastage so far. 99 doses, or 0.1% of all doses in the state, have been considered non-viable or wastage. You've also heard Secretary Smith's update on our vaccination clinics that began on Wednesday for the 75 and older Vermonters. I really can't pass up the opportunity to again say how proud I am of our teams, especially in our local health offices. Even though the COVID-19 vaccine rollout is an unprecedented effort, this is part of what we do, bringing health services to communities. Whether it's WIC, the Women, Infants and Children Program, or School Health, or immunizations or more, we connect with and serve Vermonters through these offices every day. When you think about this total undertaking that involves so many moving parts and details, it can be easy to lose sight of the big picture. I hope many of us got a glimpse of that big picture this week on the faces of our own patients or parents or grandparents that we are much closer to hugging, of our older neighbors who will no longer feel isolated in their homes, and of our friends and coworkers sharing their own relief that their loved ones will be protected from this virus. We've many more people to reach with these vaccines, but each of these moments help us look ahead with hope. We've certainly faced plenty of glitches too, and we continue to learn from them and change what we can to make it easy for Vermonters. So for those of you who do have appointments, I'll share just a few quick tips that will help make your experience a good one. First of all, we appreciate your being on time, but try not to arrive earlier than 15 minutes before your appointment. If you need someone to come with you for assistance, please try to bring only one person so we can limit the number of people inside the clinic and follow the distancing precautions appropriately. And clearly dress warmly for the weather and don't forget your mask. We again thank Vermonters for their patience and understanding. And remember, and I think the governor said it very well on Wednesday, just because you got a vaccine does not make you invincible. It does take time for the vaccine to train your body to fight COVID-19. So you might not be protected by the vaccine until a few weeks after your second dose. Second dose. Keep up all the same precautions in the meantime, wearing a mask, keeping a distance, and avoiding gatherings and travel. Governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Sorry, it is 11.40 and we do have a long queue today with 26 reporters, so I am going to ask folks to keep it to two questions. Calvin. Um, thanks, Governor. So as um, Secretary Smith mentioned, um, the signups for the 75 plus, they're beginning to kind of tail off. You know, we've already had tens of thousands apply. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what percentage of the 75 plus um, you expect to sign up and potentially when you'll um, decide to move on to the next stage band? Um, well, a lot of it will depend on the supply, obviously, but uh, we've been um, 
very satisfied to date with the number of people who signed up. I think uh, Secretary Smith had mentioned 32,500. Um, add to that uh, the about 7,000 that are in our long-term care facilities that have already received uh, the vaccine. That brings us to almost 40,000 of the 49,000. So we're getting to the point where um, that's going to not maybe not close it out, but we're well on our way uh, to uh, to accomplishing our goal. Um, We'll reflect on this and we'll want to open up the next uh, reservation list, so to speak, uh, as soon as we possibly can. But that doesn't mean they'll get to, um, we'll get them to them any quicker because it all is dependent upon the supply. But we want to be ready. So, so we don't want to open up too quick in case uh, all of a sudden the federal government decides we're going to get another allotment or more of the vaccine. Um, and that would, uh, that would uh, enable us to have more time slots available. So if we do it too quick, and then all of a sudden we find that out, uh, we won't have accommodated uh, those who are calling in and signing up. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll balance that out, but we want to get to the next HBN just as pos uh, quick as possible. And um, a question about um, school sports. You know, Secretary French, he, he mentioned that we're still working on the details and, and when that's going to be possible. But you know, we, we've heard from several, uh, you know, frustrated parents that um, they just are, are looking for answers. Um, what specifically in the data is, is the state looking for to start up um, scholastic games? And I guess we've, you know, heard people point too towards the, uh, the hockey uh, incident in, in Montpelier and how Dr. Levine said there really wasn't much transmission on the ice. Right. Um, well, again, we, uh, we are being cautious. Uh, we did open this uh, next phase up, uh, I think it was last week or the week before. Uh, we want to make sure that there not, is not any ripple effect from that, negative uh, effect on that. Uh, we're also somewhat watching uh, some of the collegiate sports, uh, as we've seen. Uh, there has been some transmission uh, between uh, players uh, on that level. So. Uh, it all factors in. Community uh, spread is prevalent in some areas. We want to make sure that uh, we don't make the problem worse. So I know people are anxious. I know people are frustrated. I know this is important to kids. It's important to all of us uh, to get back to normal. Uh, but we just don't want to make any missteps. Uh, we've done this uh, fairly well so far, um, but, um, but we don't want to set any false expectations either because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do decrease hospitalizations and, and limit the number of deaths that we're seeing, bringing that down to zero uh, if possible, but, um, but knowing um, we have our hands full in that respect. Anything you want to add to that, Dr. Lee? Yeah, the only thing I'll add is um, we are seeing some cases, even in the practice environment. It doesn't mean there's epidemics and outbreaks and all of that, but there are cases so that's noteworthy. It again reflects what's going on in the environment around us. So we need to watch that closely. As the governor said, we need a little more time uh, in terms of the incubation period of the virus. Um, we need to watch the other metrics that we always follow because they are predictors as well of how we're going to do in opening any sector, including uh, more competition in sports. I do have an update on the numbers I just provided. Our positivity rate has actually gone down even further. It's now 2.0%. And the number of hospitalizations has minimally gone down to 57 with 11 in the ICU. So we do need to watch those numbers again very carefully. Not that we're abutting against any of the uh, guardrails that we fo commonly follow, but we have to watch that very carefully. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Governor, just a quick question on uh, your reaction perhaps to uh, the talk of extending out the sales tax to so uh, much more uh, as far as broadening uh, where that applies. Uh, do you have any comment on that or, or is there anything off limits? Um, well, increasing taxes has uh, you know, kind of uh, been my, my limitation. Uh, I don't think this is the time to increase taxes on anyone. I'm happy to have the conversation about how it's done and, and, and making sure that uh, we deal with the new reality and the new economy in some respects. Um, but, um, 
but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll let the legislature have that conversation. We'll be a part of that and give as much information as possible. Um, but, uh, but I don't, uh, other than making sure that we don't raise taxes uh, during this time, which would be counterintuitive, uh, considering the struggles that we're under, um, we'll, we'll be part of the conversation. I think you had mentioned that you'd rather not see um, a tax hike, but uh, possibly broadening. Well, I, I, I'm just, if there's an equaling of some sort, I mean, happy to have the conversation. Um, but, but at this point in time, I don't think we, you know, need to get into conversations too much about restructuring other than making sure that we provide relief for those going through this. Our priority should be at this point in time getting through this crisis. This is what we need to do, making, paying attention to our economy, making sure that uh, we're, we're providing for Vermonters. As we've seen, uh, we had uh, an unexpected surplus in some respects uh, during this, uh, these last few months uh, due to the tax structure we have right now. If, they're, if the legislature is talking about reducing the burden, reducing taxation, I'm, I'm all ears and I'm a willing participant uh, but uh, but in this at this point in time, we just have to be cautious because we don't know what the surplus, how it was derived. I, I believe because of the injection of of all the federal stimulus money, uh, that that's why we're in the situation, a positive situation we're in right now. But that may not be sustainable. So I don't want to make any mistakes uh, as we work our way through this. And we should have the conversations, but let's not take uh, too many drastic steps until we know what's what's going to happen in the future. Thank you. Stewart, NBC5. Thanks. The news this morning from Johnson & Johnson that their vaccine is 66% effective, uh, or that's the first number you, you hear, which is obviously a smaller number than we've seen from Pfizer and Moderna. I'm wondering if you could help us understand that uh, does that mean it's less desirable or might be administered to a different population, uh, given the, it looks as if um, the company is going to submit uh, emergency use authorization, you know, imminently? I'm sure this is a question that Dr. Levine would like to answer. Well, you could take a shot if you want. <laughs> As you'll hear from my answer, he could give my answer, so that's not a problem. Uh, because this is, you know, this is like one of those headline pieces of news without uh, any of the details. Uh, kind of like the uh, 860 doses, but we don't really have any insight into it yet. It's the same situation. Um, what happens during this process now is that vaccine advisory body to the FDA will have all of the data. Uh, and as you're kind of alluding to, um, there is the overall number, and then there is the subgroup analyses looking at specific populations, people with chronic disease, people who have uh, some heterogeneity from a racial or age standpoint, uh, all kinds of subgroup analyses where one vaccine may look different than another. And now we're hearing um, that another metric when the company has the information is how it performs against a specific variant or not. Um, so I, I, I think anything I would say right now would be very premature um, and not well informed uh, because I haven't been given this data to uh, analyze myself. And that's what we'll learn as we go through the emergency use authorization process. What will the metric be and what will the threshold be for these advisory panels to say yes or no and advising the FDA to give it an EUA or not. Okay, uh, Dr. Levine, while you're there, I'm just, about the cold, uh, the elderly standing outside waiting for their vaccine. I mean, it's, it's nine degrees at Springfield right now and minus six with wind chill. Is that, is that dangerous in, to the point where people should consider rescheduling or do you really want to avoid that? Um, you know, what, the counsel we've given and what I'm under the impression of is that we're telling people to not stand outside in line. Uh, we're telling them to stay in their cars, be warm, and then closer to the time of their appointment, uh, be there. And that's why in my opening comments I said, you know, within 15 minutes of your appointment as opposed to uh, some of those lines we see in places like Florida where it's a little warmer, fortunately, but the people are standing for hours at a time sometime. 
That should not be the case at one of our sites because of the way the appointment scheduling goes. So I, I would not want anybody, even if they're 45 years old, uh, standing you know, for a long period of time uh, in that kind of cold environment, especially when they're not doing anything but standing in line. Okay. Uh, Governor, one question, uh, please, about this petition drive that I would imagine uh, might feel personal to you. Uh, there are almost 1,200 people who have signed this thing uh, asking you to leave the Republican Party. Uh, how, how, does, how do you take that? Well, uh, again, Stuart, just coming off uh, an election um, where we took uh, about 67% of the vote, uh, received the highest number of votes in quite some time, uh, coming off from a primary where I did fairly well in the primary, uh, do have a number of people who are not supporters of mine. That's understandable. Uh, where uh, that's, uh, that's what politics is about. Um, I mean, I think it's unfortunate, but we'll, uh, we'll see where this goes. Uh, again, at the end of the day, if the Republican Party uh, decides they don't want me to be uh, a member of their club, that's one thing. Um, but I'm still going to be a Republican at the end of the day. I still believe in the core values that I brought to the table and things that I've done uh, over the last uh, 20 years and, or plus of uh, political life. So. That doesn't change. I mean, I am who I am, and I've never, uh, I've never professed to be anything different. Thank you. Lisa, the AP. Hi, thank you. This is a question for Dr. Levine. Um, with these new variant, more infectious variants, um, particularly the one from South Africa arriving in this country, would you advise Vermonters to take even more precautions like wearing double masks and things like that? I would hope I don't have to tell anyone to take more precautions because they've been doing all the things that they should be doing every day to protect themselves and their loved ones and their communities. So in that sense, I would tell them to do exactly what they've been doing if they've been doing it all along. Um, Double masking is an interesting concept because uh, it's been in the news a lot lately. Um, the official stance uh, coming down from the newest uh, director of the CDC is actually uh, just mask, please. Uh, masking is the key. Uh, now you may feel more secure with a double mask. Perhaps uh, you, your mask keeps slipping down or whatever, so maybe the first mask will stay on and the second one uh, could slip or what have you. Or maybe you're concerned that um, uh, the side of your mask is too open, and so a double mask would help that. But the reality is, just wear a mask. That is really the core value and the thing that people need to take home. And unfortunately, if some of these new variants are as they are billed to be, more transmissible between people, you need to just keep doing all of the things you try to do all the time, and you'll keep yourself safe. Okay, and then um, in the Norwich cases, um, you said that the health department's working closely with North Norwich to refine testing protocols. Um, what are their testing protocols and, and what would be refined there? Sure, so all colleges uh, have agreed to a day zero and a day seven test. So the day the student arrives, right. they're tested regardless. They are in a quarantine situation till their day seven test where they're tested again. But what we're talking about now is because they have a significant number of cases who each have at least one, if not more, contacts, um, making, uh, refining their testing protocol with regard to their contacts and trying to make sure that we can identify anyone who's going to become a case early enough in the game. And so just helping them understand the timing of uh, when person's infectious, when a person might test positive, um, that's the kind of refinement I'm talking about. Not, not uh, to take away from the initial protocol, which still remains in place as their students return. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. I would want to also just add one other comment to what I said about um, the return to school sports. 
Um, because um, pe not, to, not that I think people think uh, anybody on our restart team is callous or anything of that sort, but people uh, frequently bring up the issue of mental health. And mental health is you know, a real significant concern nationwide in this pandemic, no matter who you are. If you're a high school student, if you're a 75-year-old, it doesn't really matter. Um, and we, un we all recognize the significant impact that uh, mental health is having on the population at large. And frequently, when we hear from parents, we hear from coaches, occasionally from the students themselves, mental health is really listed as the, the core issue uh, that we should be uh, remedying by returning everybody to uh, the competitions that they're missing. And I just want people to know, we hear your voices and we, we empathize tremendously and we recognize how big a problem this is. But again, uh, we have to do things in a measured way and use our data and really try to be careful and keep people safe. And um, talk to some of the athletes in the college sports who now have mental health issues because of the fact that they're all quarantined uh, related to the playing of their sport. And they tried to do it in a circumstance that was ultra safe with testing three times a week, uh, living a much more isolating experience than the traditional college student did between games, things of that sort. So I just wanted to add that dimension and to let people know we hear your voices and we certainly integrate that concern into the full picture. Thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Good morning. We have an 89-year-old reader whose 81-year-old wife is in palliative care with Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice. She is homebound and wheelchair bound and he is her primary caregiver. The Home Health Agency registered this man and his wife to receive a vaccine two weeks ago, but so far the agency has no vaccines and no information about when they will get the vaccines to administer. Is there a time frame for this home health care agency and other visiting nurse associations in the state? Secretary Smith. Yeah, you know, Lisa, I would think within a week we should have the plan ready to go for where we're going. There are some issues. I mean, um, we're, we're talking with the manufacturers now on the issue of transporting open vials of... Uh, of uh, vaccine and just making sure that we have permission in order to do that. But that's one of the issues that we're looking at right now is the transport from one area to the, to the next. Uh, but we have the EMS contracts in place. We have the uh, home health uh, agencies uh, ready to go from my understanding. And so I'm hoping next week I can announce what that uh, and we have a, we're going to be allocating a vaccine in that area as well. I'm hoping next week we can uh, uh, sort of map out a plan that we're just trying to get over the hurdle with CDC and the manufacturers over this one issue. Great. And another reader wanted to know how the vaccine is getting to Vermont, whether by plane or truck, and what happens after it gets here? How is it transported to the various distribution sites? Yeah, the way that it's, it, it's, it's come in a variety of right ways. I think it's FedEx, actually, that it gets here. Um, and, you know, until recently, it went directly to hospitals. It's now going to our, um, our state facility where it is stored, and then it's distributed uh, b uh, by us uh, to the various locations uh, that it needs to go. But it used, it, it, um, there's been sort of a change in that it was going directly to hospitals. It's now going to our state facility and then transported out from there. And just one quick follow-up. Were there any um, no shows or cancellations in the first two days of the vaccine distribution? And can you say a little bit more about the Vermont Common Sense, the vaccine clinic operators will exercise to avoid wasting any doses? Yeah, I think... Um, I don't have the numbers. I think they were minimal. Um, I'm not hearing that it was <laughs> widespread. I heard if there are if there are any, and I haven't heard of any. Um, it was minimal. I just wanted to make sure we have a long, like I said, we have list of eligible people. But in the end, if there's a dose that's left over, 
I do want people to use common sense and not waste that dose. And if that means if, they can, if there's a 75-year-old that's in the local hospital or, or, or a 65-year-old that's in the local hospital, use it there. At, at the same time, I'm not going to punish anybody for trying not to waste that dose. If there's somebody that they can put that dose into their arms, um, I, we have to allow that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, hello. I heard Dr. Levine earlier talking about um, Vermont sending samples out for genomic testing to see if um, we've encountered any of the, uh, the new varieties that have been spotted around the world. Um, has the nation as a whole been doing genomic testing. Uh, I guess I'm wondering if there is the kind of surveillance available um, that we have in terms of mapping um, areas of higher prevalence of COVID around the state to have a sense of when things are approaching us. I, I believe there's a protocol criteria for every region of the country. Um, and they have to send in samples on a regular basis so that they can uh, have this surveillance. But Dr. Levine can give you the details. Yeah, Joe, thanks for bringing this to attention. You know, next to uh, the issues we had with testing back in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the genome sequencing issue in this country has been raised as the second biggest disaster part of the pandemic, to be honest. We are woefully behind many, many other nations in genome sequencing and having that apparatus uh, set up and functioning at a high level, um, which is unfortunate, but it is the way life is. Um, the CDC uh, is doing genome sequencing, but it, the number of samples it will accept from any one state is limited uh, based on volume. So. We are by no means having a random sample of Vermont uh, positive PCR test being analyzed by the CDC for genome sequencing. But nothing that they've analyzed thus far has shown any of the variants, which I guess we can say that is very good news. The Norwich uh, outbreak has only further uh, solidified our resolve to make sure that we have more capacity to do genome sequencing. I would like to say we could already give you results, but due to technical factors in the kinds of swabs that were used for the test that got sent uh, to Boston, uh, that assay can't be used for genome sequencing. So we have to use a different assay, which means positive students will have to be reswabbed for that genome sequence test. Uh, but We're working very closely with the lab in Boston that we uh, have worked with for these college samples. And we're also working with the state of Massachusetts as well and with UVM to ramp up, if you will, that capacity for genome sequencing and get a true reflection of what's going on. But just in answer to your question, remember, there was a case in Saratoga. There's now a case in Essex County, New York. There, um, have been cases in Boston and in Massachusetts. So um, we all know that it's around us and it will show up, and we just need to make sure our ability to find it quickly when it shows up is there. Um, just to be clear, um, what we're talking about right now is the variety that first came to public attention uh, when it showed up in Great Britain and not the, um, I guess, more troubling variety that has appeared in South Africa? Yes, that, that's what I was talking about in my last sentence or two of comments. Uh, but genome sequencing will, will, you know, will find all of them. So that's the goal. Uh, but you're right, the one that is of more immediate concern just because we know about it in the region is the UK variant. Thank you very much. Tom, the Vermont Standard. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is a question, uh, presumably for for uh, Dr. Levine and perhaps for Secretary Smith, and it relates a bit to uh, what Dr. Levine said earlier regarding the mental health uh, benefits and so on of, of competitive sports for youth. Um, we're seeing an, incre an we're seeing an increased uh, amount of attention in the national media in recent days to uh, rising rates of depression, anxiety, and even suicide among children, adolescents, and teenagers tied to COVID, social distancing, and so on. And I just wondered, I, this question that's come up here before, but I'd like to get a current snapshot of uh, how the state characterizes our experience with uh, youth mental health issues in the present day and uh, what we're doing to work with local mental health providers to respond. Yeah, I think, uh, again, I'll let Dr. Levine answer the question more broadly, but uh, we've heard from our pediatricians, for instance, uh, about the need to get back to in-person learning uh, because there is such a prevalence of, uh, uh, of the emotional drain uh, on, on our kids. Uh, they need that contact. They need to be back in school, and that's why it's a priority for us. We're working on it with the stakeholders and teachers and superintendents and so forth. And hopefully we'll get to a point where we can get back uh, everyone, all the, all the uh, um, districts will be able to get back to in-person learning because we know that's what's best for our kids. And just to augment that, the, um, the reality you speak of is, is, is quite clear and quite true, uh, but the other reality is that we have a mental health system in Vermont that does have capacity um, especially for this kind of outpatient interaction that we're thinking about, whether it be done in person or uh, through telepsychiatry, I guess you would call it, or telebehavioral health. Um, I think the good news from what you've recited to us is that people are admitting to symptoms and acknowledging these issues. We would hate for people to feel that they are need to hide that because that's a sign of weakness or what have you. So I would just shout out to anybody in the child, adolescent, or parent arena that we have systems in Vermont, and Sarah Squirrel, our Commissioner for Mental Health, has talked about this at a previous press conference, that are poised and ready to accommodate uh, any and all who may have these issues and want to deal with a professional to help uh, improve their outlook. So uh, please make sure that um, don't hide those things and in this sort of mentality of avoid gatherings and distance from one another, that doesn't mean keep yourself from accessing services that are really available to you even during a pandemic, if not now more than ever. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, good afternoon. I have a couple of quick questions. Uh, Governor, when you first started talking this morning, you indicated that the mask and uh, social distancing will stay around for a while. Any indication on when that will end? And I'm also wondering if there's any concerns about large uh, gatherings now that we're going to be having Super Bowl in about um, just over a week, as well as Daytona 500 coming up in mid-February, and if there's any concerns about live gatherings and your recommendations for people who are planning those? Um, well, first of all, uh, when I made the comments about uh, masking will be around and some of these uh, guidelines that we've been talking about for the last 10 months will be around for a while longer. Uh, it's just due to the fact that we are distributing, uh, we're vaccinating uh, as quick as we possibly can with the supplies we have. It's going to be a while before um, um, all the groups can, and all Vermonters will have that ability to be vaccinated. So in the meantime, we have to keep doing what we're doing. Um, even if you've, as I said, uh, I think it was on Tuesday, even if you've received the vaccine of late, that doesn't, uh, uh, that doesn't prevent you uh, from, uh, from getting uh, uh, 
the transmission of the disease. It doesn't mean that you're not going to get COVID. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time for you to, to for the, uh, the vac uh, vaccine to to work its way in to your system. So, and get your second dose as well. So that's a, a matter of a, a month to two months. So the, the message is, in the meantime, we just need to continue to exercise the practices we've been doing so well over the last uh, 10, 11 months uh, until we get through this and we get through the uh, vaccination process. In terms of the uh, uh, Super Bowl parties, the Daytona 500 parties, uh, again, um, we, would, we would advise uh, that you don't get together, uh, that you do it uh, uh, individually, you watch it uh, at home, uh, and you try and to do whatever you can to interact uh, with your friends and family in a different way, uh, because this is still prevalent here. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe next year uh, we'll be able to do this uh, together uh, like we have in the past, but uh, this isn't the year. Uh, you need to avoid those gatherings. We've seen uh, where these types of gatherings amongst multiple households had led us to outbreaks. Uh, the latest, I think, was in Bennington, uh, where we saw a number of cases, uh, and and uh, we've seen a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of spread within uh, Bennington County region. Uh, a lot of that can be uh, can be uh, uh, looked back uh, upon these uh, these multifamily gatherings. So, again, avoid them if at all possible, and uh, and wait until next year or another opportunity. Uh, when we get through this, when when the times are much safer. Okay, great, thank you. Pat, WCAS. Hi, I'm going to piggyback off of the last question that was just asked. Um, I know the science is still kind of undecided on whether people who have been vaccinated and are fully vaccinated could spread COVID-19. But at what point, I guess, will the state make the call that the people who are fully vaccinated can go about more normal lives and we trust the vaccine works? Dr. Levine. I can tell you quite candidly that the entire governor's leadership team discussed that issue just this morning. Um, so um, there are a few states that are already trying to be a little bit ahead uh, of the science, to be honest and say that perhaps if you've been vaccinated, you are uh, able to pretty much do everything you want and, and move on. Um, most states are being more reserved than that at this point in time, especially because we're so early into this national vaccination effort. The CDC has not yet weighed in. Um, I'm sure they will, uh, and I, very much respect their new leadership and believe that uh, this is one of the top of their agenda items. Uh, so I don't want to offer people, um, you know, um, overpromise them with hope uh, or um, make them feel despair either way, because it's really something that we're really grappling with. It's a very challenging situation. To, it, it, it's a kind of question we want an answer for, and things are moving so fast in this pandemic that we want the answer to be the one we want it to be. But at the same time, we do have a little bit of time yet to wait for some more data to emerge and some uh, more broad national guidance. And I say national guidance not to punt and say, you know, we in Vermont don't want to be innovative this time, because as you know, we're often the trendsetters and we're very creative and innovative. But this is an example of something that really does beg for a national policy uh, because it has so much to do with how we live our lives and when we cross borders of other states or other countries and when others come into our borders, and et cetera. So it's a pretty high impact uh, discussion and it really needs to be done with uh, some element of uh, deliberateness uh, so that we can really um, make the right decision and not just make it uh, in isolation necessarily, but make it as part of a, a broad consensus. I hope that answers it for you. It does. Um, and then taking it slightly more specific uh, to a group that already has been vaccinated and is approaching the being fully vaccinated point. When can or should senior living 
facilities, long-term care facilities, resume some of the programming that they might have put on pause for residents during the pandemic that encouraged um, interaction between people within the facility. Because yep. one would think, in theory, if everyone in there is vaccinated, there shouldn't be a need for more restrictions within this cohort anymore, correct? Absolutely. And, I, and I'm looking forward to that with much optimism, whether it be a visitation policy, whether it be a more community dining kind of uh, thing or game room or what have you, uh, social events, things of that sort at these facilities. They're begging for that, I'm sure. It's been a very long, lonely time. The reality is uh, there are some pretty good guidelines in place. We actually haven't talked about them as pretty good in the past from CMS because they, we thought they were dangerous at times and would open things up too much, but they're very appropriate for this period of time where we're trying to open things up in a fashion where people are vaccinated at a high rate. So this has to do with the testing protocols and how a long-term care facility can move from a lower phase to a higher phase and uh, improve all of those things like visitation and other activities. So we'll rely on those uh, to be able to make those decisions in a much more informed way. And I think you'll start to see the pace of that increase once we get uh, everybody past their second dose of vaccine several weeks later. So that's certainly on the uh, drawing board of both the Department of Health, the Agency of Human Services, and Dale, uh, our agency for uh, independent living uh, and aging. So that's how uh, a little, little glimpse at what we perceive in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Good morning, Governor. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Special thanks to Mike Smith for his quick response and uh, hopefully getting some possible vaccination sites located in Grand Isle County after the county. It was ignored. Uh, in just one day, I got an email saying the state is working with three schools up there to uh, in the health center. And uh, the readers have sent us emails asking you to asking to give thanks to you guys. Um, <clears throat> my question today actually has been delayed a couple of times, but sort of dovetails with the transparency issue that you mentioned with the Springfield Hospital spoilage. Um, the health department finally did provide a partial list of the outbreaks in Vermont recently after we were told the public had to file a formal public records request uh, from Dr. Levine talks about the large outbreaks and the people impacted. And I wanted to ask about an outbreak at one of the hospitals. Um, the health department sent the list, but it withheld the name of the hospital. Yet the public list includes McDonald's restaurant in Rupp. And the health department also included an unidentified fire department, which we're wondering what the name is, but doesn't bother to tell the taxpayers in that town get it list places like St. John's Berry Subaru has had an outbreak where the public goes in. Um, and there's a whole lot of other businesses listed on this that I'm not going to bother to identify, but just wondering uh, what can be done to even the playing field so that everybody is treated alike here in Vermont and, and that the public can get information so they can make well reasoned decisions about their health, where to go, where not to go. And, if the people, and again, I appreciate the Springfield Hospital uh, transparency, people down there can now make a decision whether they want to go there or they can go to another site nearby instead of their shots. Uh, is there any way to increase the transparency here? Uh, Dr. Levine. I'll try to address every facet of what you said. You covered a lot, Mike. Um, first of all, I'll go on record. The public should consider using Springfield Hospital for their care and for their vaccine. I would dare say that uh, multiple healthcare settings around the state at some point in the last several years would have had similar issues regarding temperature regulation of a vaccine. I would hate for any of them to be characterized in a negative way because that may have happened to them because this is part of what happens. 
And this is why we have sensor equipment. This is why we have very specifically regulated refrigeration equipment, et cetera. But these things do happen, and that's why all the systems are in place to make sure that we're alerted to them quickly and they don't cause any harm. Second of all, many of the uh, more anonymously listed uh, places uh, on the list you have uh, are because of potential violations of personal and patient confidentiality. So it has to do with the size of the amount of employees that are there, the total size of the place, and what percentage of them may have been positive or not positive. Um, there are a whole variety of epidemiologic considerations um, legally supported that go into determining if we can actually put a name next to uh, a certain number of uh, positive cases. The other part... But can you tell me that we have a hospital in, in Vermont, that there's some hospital in Vermont, is so tiny that it cannot be identified? I'm going to have to get the details on that hospital uh, listing you're talking about to speak more eloquently about it, but let me go on. With regards to, okay. uh, with regards to uh, what you said, Vermonters making a decision about where they go or where they don't go, I would hate for that uh, to be the end result of what knowing a, pers a particular place would be. For instance, um, the reality is you can find multiple fast food restaurants, I'm sure, that would have a case because people live in their communities and they essentially go to work and then they may get sick and test positive. And we want to make sure that no one in their work site is a close contact, etc. cetera. Um, but whether or McDonald's or a Burger King or who knows what, um, your decision to drive up to the window probably shouldn't be biased by knowing if there was a case or wasn't a case. Likewise, God forbid you don't call the fire department because you heard there was an outbreak there and they might come to your house and give you COVID because we would hope that your municipality actually understands who has cases, who doesn't, who needed to be quarantined, who didn't, and who is available to work and who's not available to work so that you can continue to maintain faith in your fire department. Um, this goes on to any sector of the economy we're talking about, any sector of our lives that we're talking about. We want people to make decisions based on not just seeing a name on a list or a number of cases on a list, but on the public health implications of what's going on there. And just like we've alerted people numerous times to situations that occur around the state, because there are public health implications and they need to know about them, there are also, thank goodness, way more abundant situations that actually have no public health implications for anyone, and the contact tracing has been done, and it was one case at one McDonald's, uh, just like it could have been one case in the office that somebody else works in. So these are all the kinds of considerations that go into uh, how this data needs to be portrayed and discussed, and how the public needs to integrate uh, knowledge of when it's a public health issue that they should really be careful with versus when it's not. Um, so I, I just need to emphasize that uh, as part of the point. We also you know, clearly know of many businesses that have um, been stigmatized and received, um, received the brunt of criticism that they didn't deserve just because they happen to have cases. We're also aware of um, major congregate living facilities where buses wouldn't stop and postal service wouldn't deliver mail because cases had been identified. Uh, and these were really unjustifiable actions knowing uh, what was going on on the ground there. And so I, I again, I'm trying to make sure that we discuss this topic in the context of really understanding some of the unintended consequences and some of the uh, implications that having this knowledge uh, can give somebody. But again, th these are outbreaks. These are not single cases. And shouldn't people in the Springfield area 
have the right to make a determination as to whether they're going to go to Springfield, Rockingham, Hartford, based on what they hear. And and I do understand you think that people aren't going to call 911 when somebody's breaking into their house. But I, I suggest that they don't care when they call 911, whether somebody's coming in a blue, gray, or green uniform. They want service. Correct. Correct. Um, I agree with so you. So there'd be no reason not to. Yeah, I mean, you guys hid the Bennington Police Department. You hid three pharmacies earlier this year, last year, that when you were urging people to go get flu shots, but yet these, at least three unnamed pharmacies had um, outbreaks. Shouldn't the public be aware that they might be walking into those places? That's all I'm, we're asking. And I, I right. actually tried to address this to Secretary Smith and uh, the governor because Obviously, this is the health department's position. I'm asking more on the greater scale of the state. But. Sure, I'll just I'll just make one more comment on it. Uh, the definition of an outbreak can be as few as two people or three people, so keep that in mind. An outbreak is not necessarily a uh, hundred plus people or large numbers. Um, it can be very very small and narrowly defined by an epidemiologic definition that has no implications for any person's public health who would frequent such a, a venue. Levine, if, if there's an outbreak at a location that would indicate the health department is involved and therefore any other health personnel would be positive would not be working. Exactly. So if we've listed it as an outbreak, it means we've already determined it was an outbreak. All the contact tracing has been done. And if, if the facility needed to be closed, it was closed. If it was a school and a classroom needed to be uh, remote, it was sent remote, et cetera. So that all work is occurring every time, uh, especially at the level of an outbreak. I know we're pressed for time, so I will <laughs> stop there. So, some of these places still have outbreaks, right? I mean, the list that you sent, some of these have outbreaks ongoing, it looks like. Yeah, so often an outbreak won't be in the resolved column for 28 days because we have to wait for two incubation periods to pass without a new case. So that's another thing that could be very misleading, whereas on December 27th, one could actually see an outbreak, and it could still be on the list mid-January, yet nothing's going on there at all, and everybody's uh, recovered, and things have been fine, but it may still show up on the list. Thank you very much. Burlington Free Press. Brent, Brent. I, um, right. Yep. Hi. Um, I write a lot about restaurants, and obviously they're struggling these days. And I wonder if somebody could talk a little bit more about plans for. Uh, perhaps long term heading towards spring, which is actually only less than a couple months away, even though it doesn't feel like it today. But um, ways that maybe uh, the state will try to work with restaurants to improve business that has taken such a hit over the past year. I know the uh, Better Places program is uh, starting to roll out right now, but I wonder if someone could talk a little bit more about long term plans for helping restaurants. Yeah, getting back to some sort of normalcy is in, important. Um, what we've done, uh, again, over the last uh, a few months with the relief funds, stimulus relief funds, recovery funds we've received from uh, Congress, we've been able to, uh, to point a lot of them in the direction to make sure that these businesses survive uh, and then recover. Uh, we're still in that mode, uh, as you know, hospitality sector. Uh, isn't just about uh, opening up uh, the the percentage of people who can come. I mean, the lodging facility, for instance, we we had that open at 100% for a number of months now, but people aren't coming because uh, we have uh, some restrictions on travel, as do other states. So people are and people uh, don't feel confident in traveling either. So. Um, there are a number of obstacles in the way that are out of our control in a lot of respects until we get uh, a handle on the virus itself and try to get the vaccination process moving along. 
uh, so that we can get as many people again uh, in a position where we can travel, we can uh, go to restaurants, and and people feel confident in doing so. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I know there's another recovery package being debated in Congress. Uh, we hope uh, that the, that at least a portion of that will come our way, uh, so that we can uh, keep these businesses going until. Spring, uh, when better weather, uh, opening up, outdoor dining, uh, and some of the measures that uh, that we've uh, uh, that we put into place uh, will help. So, again, everything that we've done, uh, we uh, believe, has helped them recover or helped them stay alive and survive. Um, but also during better times, better weather, uh, to help them uh, in their business. Uh, so. Um, we'll continue uh, moving down this path, um, but they are not forgotten from my perspective. Uh, I know the hospitality sector in particular has been hardest hit, and uh, we have an obligation to, to help them. And that's why you know we had a $10 million package that we have in the budget adjustment um, that, uh, that we offered to the, uh, the legislature. And uh, uh, thus far, I don't believe the House has uh, looked favorably upon that. Uh, they want to do it to maybe in, a, in the, the big bill, but that won't be passed for a number of months. Um, and this is important. So uh, anything we can do uh, to help them in the meantime, to get them through this, uh, we'll continue to focus on. Uh, one quick follow-up. Um, some restaurants that have opened, especially in the last year, have talked about uh, a, they have expensive startup costs. Yeah, we lost you. I'm sorry. All right, friends, if you want to, if you want to email me or give some more to your follow-up. I, I will say, I mean, you mentioned uh, the restaurant that may have opened up in the last year or so. Uh, a lot of those businesses uh, wouldn't have... Um, been able to get PPP loans, uh, would not have qualified for some of the initiatives that the uh, the Congress has put forward. And that's exactly what this uh, $10 million package, uh, the types of businesses, this $10 million package would help. Um, so that's why we're moving, trying to move forward with it and trying to get it passed now so we can get them relief uh, as we speak. All right, if that didn't answer your question, Brent, you can shoot us an email and we'll get you the answers. Uh, Aaron, VT Digger. Yes, I believe, Secretary, so I, I believe I heard you say that you did a review of 1A group and found that some vaccinations of people did not fall into 1A, although you believe the majority of them did. What kind of review did you do um, to ensure, you know, to check whether people fell in 1A? And, um, you know, people that received vaccinations but were not in 1A, have you figured out why uh, they got vaccinated anyway? Secretary Smith. As you know, we, um, the vaccination program in 1A was predominantly uh, administered through the hospitals uh, as we went forward. We issued various Hans in terms of what was available. We issued various lists in terms of what was, what, who were eligible, uh, various Hans health uh, advisory um, notifications of what was, uh, what was eligible. But we did find that, it, that there was discrepancies between uh, various, um, what I would call districts around hospitals and what they were, their service areas around hospitals wasn't widespread um, and we didn't go into enormous detail uh, in terms of what we were looking at but we did notice and we did hear of some that um, were vaccinated I, I think on this call we heard of some that were uh, that were vaccinated that that shouldn't have been vaccinated we've clarified that now as I said in my remarks, we've clarified that now. We've provided toolkits to make sure that doesn't happen. We haven't expanded any of the 1A qualifications. We've just made sure that it's very clear what we're talking about. And by the okay, way, and by, and, 
And by the way, that's going to become less and less of an issue because um, we're, we're moving to phase um, two now where there's a registration process, there's an affirmation process in that registration process. So this is going to become less and less of an issue. Has the, has the topic kind of informed discussions about what would happen if you expanded eligibility to frontline essential workers or kind of a more broad category of essential workers? Yeah, I'm not sure that we've had uh, certain discussions on that, but if we did a group of frontline workers, obviously that's going to be a problem uh, in terms of how we would qualify, how would we make sure that those frontline workers are the eligible group that we're talking about. We haven't gotten that far yet, Aaron, on our discussions on where we are. We have to get through the three age bands and then the um, the age group with underlying conditions, but I, I will tell you, um, this age group, uh, this the 1A was pretty easy. I mean, either you're a resident in a um, long-term care facility, you worked in a long-term care facility, or you were a healthcare worker, and some instances um, that, uh, you know, we, we found where some in that, uh, in that definition got expanded inadvertently. Um, but we will have to pay more attention to this issue as we start expanding um, those what, what you call frontline workers. I think it's going to be very important that we're very specific on it and we make sure that we're, uh, uh, we have some sort of controlling devices on that. Okay, thank you. Are there any Thanks, Rebecca. I'll even number these. First, on Wednesday, I asked when will some downstate pharmacies be enlisted in vaccine distribution the way that 20 kinney drugs locations have up north, and I wonder if there's anything new on that. And second, there were three temperature monitors used with the doses at Springfield Hospital, two read within the correct temperature range, one was above that. Which was incorrect? Sean, I'll take the first one. Obviously, our agreement right now with our partnership is with Kinney's, but we're looking at locations down there that uh, we can open up to uh, to help with the situation that you did. You just got to give me uh, uh, a little bit more time than a couple days. And I'll pass it over to Dr. Levine on the second question. On the second question, that's a big part of the uh, reason for the site visit that's occurring today. So I don't have uh, all full data for you. I do know, though, that uh, all the temperature data was provided to Moderna, and they were very comfortable in giving us the decision that they gave us. And uh, again, uh, not to build off too much on Mike Donahue's question about Springfield Hospital, but Moderna told us that literally in the course of a week, there were many, many, many hundreds of phone calls just like ours uh, and situations just like ours because this is so common in the vaccine world uh, because of the uh, specificity with which they advise you about the temperature bandwidth that uh, vaccines can be stored at. So they were very, very comfortable uh, in assessing our situation in context of all of the situations they've had in this very short time that vaccine's being used. So we'll have more for you uh, at another time. Would you say that the Moderna range is um, narrower than it needs to be? <clears throat> uh, I'm not qualified to answer that. That's a very um, specific scientific question based on all the research that went on in their vaccine. So we will rely on that, that range, and, and that range is what uh, their vaccine was approved at for an emergency use authorization. Thank you. Hello, we have a question directly from a viewer who they were in the previous uh, grouping, so a healthcare worker or someone in a long-term care facility, and they're saying that they were not able to get their shot. What should they do now? 
Yeah, that will still be available to them, but uh, Secretary Smith. Avery, I had mentioned this in my opening remarks. We are not um, shutting down phase 1A. We will continue to, uh, uh, to do uh, phase 1A. Unfortunately, some, uh, because we're transitioning to uh, phase 2, some took that to mean that we're no longer providing uh, vaccines for phase 1, the 1A grouping. Uh, that's not the case. We will uh, continue to provide vaccine for that that area. So we are allocating vaccine for 1A uh, to the hospitals um, in the upcoming week. And so that you that person should uh, use the regular channels that they uh, were told to use to get the uh, 1A vaccine. So they um, told us that they actually received a response from when they tried to sign up and it said given the state of Vermont shift to the next phase of vaccine distribution and very limited supplies of vaccine, we are temporarily pausing direct scheduling of tier 1A eligible individuals. For yeah, point. yeah the, the word pause was unfortunate. Um, what we were doing during that time was asking uh, hospitals who had uh, inventory to use their inventory uh, up uh, during that week. We are now allocating doses. Uh, so. Um, you know, I, I saw the the word pause, and it would have probably caused some confusion on my uh, if I read that same thing as well. Okay, and just a quick related question as well: Does the state have a schedule they are planning to release to the public of these tiers and the the deadlines that they're setting? It's age, all, age bands, I use tiers. Yeah, it's all, it's all based on registration, and uh, as we, I think. Um, your colleague, Kelvin, um, asked a similar question about when is the next age ban going to be um, uh, going to be opened up? And the governor answered, when we start looking at the various registrations, the allocations and putting it together, I don't have a time frame f for you right now, but we're looking at this just about every day uh, to determine when's, when's a good time to open up the next uh, age band. Now, it, it, it will be open enough for registration. Um, you know, we're on a five-week schedule for to get through this age band, but um, opening it up for registration, uh, we'll make a determination, I think, um, in the next uh, few weeks and uh, go from there, as the governor mentioned. Thank you. Hi, Governor. Getting back to the Tax Commission, uh, the other big kahuna was uh, switching out the property tax for the income tax. If it were uh, an even sum, sum game, would you care one way or the other whether the property tax was funding the, the education fund or the income tax? Does it matter? Yeah, just looking for, for parity. Um, you know, my concern has been all along, details matter. Um, if we just switched automatically over to an income tax, it might uh, further um, burden Vermonters. And uh, right now, we have this spread over uh, a larger population uh, outside of our borders. So again, the details matter. Um, we'll hopefully have the conversation. But uh, from my perspective, let's uh, let's uh, let's walk uh, before we run. Uh, let's get through this pandemic uh, and focus on the on the task at hand. One of the other issues they brought up was the, now that the current complication in, in doing this. Um, is there a, is, is that a, a, a big concern in, in doing any kind of change? Is the, the, the complication of, of the whole process at this point? Well, ob yeah, obviously um, there's a lot of moving pieces there. And uh, we don't, you know, you have to consider uh, what the ripple effect, uh, what, what, you know, if you make any change at all, uh, that could have an impact somewhere else. Uh, so we want to just make sure, again, as I said, uh, better better walk before we run. Let's not get into this uh, too quickly. And that's this isn't a knee-jerk reaction moment. Uh, we've known uh, this has been an issue for quite some time. We should have uh, conversations about this and and uh, and have uh, some of the debates uh, in the, within the, the legislative process. So I think everyone should weigh in. Uh, but again. How does this, uh, you know, does this put us at a, uh, um, 
uh, unfair uh, disadvantage, uh, let's say, if we were to tax certain services as compared to another state that does not. I mean, we just have to, to weigh all that out and go in with our eyes wide open because what seems simple uh, may not be as simple as you think uh, until you get into it. The other part of the equation is um, I would hope uh, that we look on as what we can do to make uh, the, the spending side of the equation. Uh, let's, uh, we should take a look at that at the same time. This doesn't have to be about funding just a $2 billion system and figuring out ways to, to fund it differently. Maybe uh, to get more affordability, we just make, make sure that the system that we have is working as efficiently as possible uh, so that, uh, that uh, Vermonters aren't burdened further. Great, thank you, Governor. All right, it is quarter of one, and we have 10 left in the queue. We'll go to Greg at the County Courier. Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, Rebecca, you'll be happy to hear that I'm going to try to keep it to one question, and I'm not going to be asked to bank a question because I think I've probably overdrafted that bank at this point. Uh, I don't know if this is for Governor or Dr. Levine. Uh, in regards to the vaccines at the Springfield Hospital, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I assume those vaccines are going to stay there to be deployed there. Uh, will the patients be notified that their vaccine was part of the group that went slightly above the temperature range, or will that just get mixed in and, and nobody's going to know uh, if their vaccine was part of that? Yeah, I think that's a Dr. Levine question. I don't have the answer to that. If they're deemed safe, I would just assume that they'd just be put into inventory uh, and then you would, you know, that, that they're safe. The Moderna has deemed them safe. Everyone says they're safe. So I'm not sure why we would separate them. I, I guess I was curious, uh, you know, six months down the road, if it turned out that some of these patients were indeed getting uh, COVID, if, if there would be a way to track back and be like, okay, you know, that was the group that went slightly above or six months from now you could go back and say, oh, we were right. There's no higher indicator here. And thank you for bringing it up because that's exactly what I was going to say. Every time you're administered a vaccine, there's a lot number and it's carefully recorded. So if any untoward event occurred, that's usually why it's recorded. Uh, it could be traced back to what you got. So the reality is, that, that connection will always be there. Uh, but as I alluded to, this happens to vaccines literally every day in this country uh, for some vaccine or another. And uh, as, you, as long as the vaccine has been approved for use and it's deemed still effective and safe, um, nobody gets that kind of informed process. If people are nervous about that, I can say that clearly the second dose they would get would not be from the same lot because that will have been exhausted very quickly uh, so that they would be getting a second dose that would be very separate um, and still retain the effectiveness that they're concerned about. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I guess we'll see you on Tuesday. Guy Page. Hello, Governor. Have you been advised on the impact of Vermont fuel price and availability, if any, of stopping construction on the XL Keystone pipeline? I, I can answer no. I have not. Uh, that hasn't risen to, uh, to my desk at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca and uh, Governor Scott, uh, Scott hope all is well um, for the both of you. Um, obviously here at NSN, we work directly with thousands of student athletes, fans, coaches, athletic directors. Um, so my questions here are not, all, not only just on behalf of NSN, uh, but they're also on behalf of a big chunk of uh, all the aforementioned as, as well. Um, part, my first question has to deal with the data more along the line. Uh, considering the success um, of your neighboring peers, your neighboring states, 
in their execution of high school sports this fall, as well as this winter, uh, your success um, in, executing, in executing uh, Vermont Fall Sports. Uh, can you give us an update on what statistical data you're referring to um, as to what's holding you back from giving uh, Vermont the green light on this, especially when the statistical data nationally, as well as the statistical data um, from your neighboring states, shows that high school sports are at very low risk and they, they do not, they have not affected transmission rates, you know, to a, to a high rate. Um, to go along with the fact that, you know, you guys have said, you know, Vermonters are doing very well with, con- with the controlling of this and that you're one of the healthiest in the states, uh, healthiest states in, you know, in the country. I guess what my, my question is, is what data, how is your data so much different than everybody else's data that um, you're not allowed to give these kids uh, the go-ahead and, um, and move forward here with this winter season? Um, I may refer to Secretary Moore. Um, she has any of that data. Dr. Levine may want to weigh in. Uh, I might ask if you, if you can tell me which neighbor, neighboring states you're referring to. Obviously, um, New Hampshire is, is one of the neighboring states that have been going very strong uh, here with their, with their winter sports. Well, I, 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 I just I, maybe I'll just stop you there. I mean, I, and again, uh, this has this is all uh, data, uh, but um, but I I yep. watch their numbers every single day. Um, they have um, upwards to uh, seven to seven hundred to a thousand cases every single day. They have just now uh, exceeded. I think they're over a thousand deaths in uh, in New Hampshire. They're twice our population. So they're five times uh, what the what we've experienced. So, you know, we're doing something right here, and and I'm not sure yeah, where no, all absolutely. the cases are. So, so I would say, you know, a lot of that's community spread, and and they have to be integrated with some of the sports. Uh, I would say uh, I'm not saying that that's the problem, uh, but uh, but their consideration, their guidelines are a little bit different. Uh, their thresholds are different than ours. But Secretary Moore, anything you can offer? as to uh, what we've yes, been looking uh, at. happy to, Governor. Uh, so, so we have a, a phased restart plan. Uh, obviously, the first phase took effect back on December 26th, and it allowed for no contact practices. Our assessment of the efficacy of that approach was looking at the, the FE data and seeing that there were no close contacts identified through sports. Um, which gave us confidence that, that folks were adhering to the, um, the guidance we'd produced. We advanced to phase two of the return to play um, on January 18th, which allows for for expanded practices, what people I think would think of more traditionally with contact, as well as some team-based scrimmage activities. Um, But we really need at least a couple of weeks of being in that posture to be able to determine whether it's it's having an impact on virus cases and, and, frankly, um, any changes in what, what has to take place for in, in-person instruction in our schools, which remains our priority. Um, so we will be taking a, a look at the EPI data again at the beginning of next week um, and discussing what an appropriate timeline is uh, to potentially move to that, that third phase that I know folks are so looking forward to, uh, which is games. But I, I think Dr. Levine made a couple of really important points earlier about the the real benefits we have heard from students um, and coaches alike about being able to to resume practices, and we are being cautious in trying to protect and preserve that opportunity, all all the while looking at um, what might be able to come next. Thank you very much. That answers my first part. Now, the second one's a little interesting question. Uh, it's about the cooperative program. So, for instance, um, there's a small community which uh, up in north in the north uh, eastern part of Vermont, Cane of Vermont, obviously. Um, they have they have a cooperative program with uh, Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, and Pittsburgh obviously has been given the green uh, green light to participate in competitive sports, and um, they are being affected obviously by um, the fact that we aren't allowed in Vermont to uh, move forward. Has there been any discussions or dialogue in regards to those kids um, who might not get a season whatsoever? Um, and if so, what is that dialogue? Is, is there anything that, I, that you can send to them for a message 
um, so that you know they have something to, to look forward to, that type of deal. We, we have had some of those discussions about bordering communities. Uh, Secretary Moore, anything you can offer? Yeah, I, I would indicate that, that there are there are several, both the, the Canaan School District as well as a couple of in the Upper Valley, and we have been working um, with those school districts and the Education Agency and Secretary French on uh, appropriate solutions given the, the individual circumstances of each of the schools. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate both of you, uh, both of you for the feedback. I appreciate it. All right. Next up, we have Andrea. Seven days. Hi there. Um, I have um, two questions. Uh, the first is um, I, I just read a um, CDC paper that came out this week suggesting that. Um, shutting thing, down things like in-person dining at restaurants um, might be a way to prioritize reopening schools, um, especially in areas where virus levels are high. Um, is that something that the administration is considering or, or might consider as a potential tool um, for achieving that goal of full in-person school um, in April? Um, we're, we're not seeing uh, the outbreaks in some of the dining facilities. We're at 50 percent capacity. Um, we, uh, we have a uh, limited uh, number of people uh, able to dine at the same table. They have to be of the same family. We have a number of restrictions in place. So we don't believe that is the problem and that would help in any way uh, to opening up schools at this point in time. Um, thanks. And um, the second question um, is a question we got from a reader um, whose father is in the 70 to 75 age group, so not yet eligible for a vaccine, um, but uh, battling um, cancer, has a weakened immune system, and needs uh, crucial treatment to kind of interrupt the progression, um, but cannot get that until after he's vaccinated. Um, the reader is um, concerned that the delay in treatment will allow the cancer to progress much further and really reduce the chance of a good outcome. Um, so I think the question there is why aren't serious medical needs like this uh, where COVID would really impact that outcome um, regardless of age um, prioritized among uh, this first vaccine group? Um, in this particular case, the the um, person in question will be in the next age band, but others battling similar conditions, um, you know, might might not be there, um, particularly as we do get down to the 70 and 65 um, age groups where that case fatality rate has been lower. Um, why wouldn't other conditions that um, sort of don't fit that age group, but um, do really heighten those risks of complications or really delay treatment um, be included? Um, and it's, it's just that it's easier to define and verify age than severe medical conditions. Yeah, again, I think uh, Dr. Levine can answer this, but uh, as we saw with the data, uh, it's 90% of the deaths we've seen. We're priori prioritizing prevention of, of death. Um, so 90% of the deaths we've seen thus far are in the population over 65. Um, so that's where we thought we should go first. It's not a perfect system, but it's easily understood. Um, the next population uh, that, uh, that Dr. Levine and others had determined in terms of uh, the type of health conditions uh, we want to, uh, to focus on is uh, fairly significant. It's a, a large population. So we were able to get to the 90% uh, of the population, the 90% of, uh, uh, of, of those we have experienced death uh, in a far quicker way. So that's just been our priority. If we had more of the supply, more vac vaccine available, obviously we do a much larger population, but that just isn't reality at this point. Dr. Levine. And just to reiterate, uh, we're using the data, we're using the age, and we're using the percentage of deaths that occur in Vermont uh, and the case fatality rates in each of those age bands to have made this decision. Um, because it really is significant for that population. It does not mean by any means that we think less of people who have high-risk conditions, um, but 
The reality is, it's really hard to move every Vermonter to the front of the line. Whether you have cancer and you're on treatment or waiting to have treatment, whether you're a transplant recipient and are on immunosuppressive drugs, which you've been on for the whole year of the pandemic, but now that there's a vaccine, uh, there seems to be a more urgency to uh, protect you even more than you've been protecting yourself now. Whether you have one of the chronic conditions and you feel that it is of such severity that it warrants you going to the front, we would literally be uh, equaling the number of people in this first age band uh, if we were giving a pass to each person. Uh, again, don't want to sound callous. I have tremendous empathy for everyone. Uh, but the reality is we don't want the fact that there is a vaccine available to interfere with someone's cancer therapy. If the, if the vaccine can't be received as quickly as that individual would like it to, it doesn't mean that their cancer therapy needs to be turned off and they're allowed to languish and suffer from their cancer. Um, these are the very hard decisions that all clinicians are making every day. Uh, during the pandemic about how to manage their patients uh, appropriately. And the reality is we would love to have 300,000 doses of vaccine coming in in the next month and we could reassure everybody that they're going to get what they want. But with eight to 9,000 doses a week, these are very, very challenging uh, circumstances that we're dealing with. Thank goodness we're not dealing with the kinds of ethical dilemmas Los Angeles and other places in the country are dealing with where they have to decide if a person should even be dropped off at the hospital by EMS or should get a ventilator or even get an ICU room. Um, those are got to be tremendously heartbreaking, challenging decisions. Um, we're not there in Vermont, thank goodness. But we can't again um, take our eyes off of this North Star of really using the data and trying to preserve lives as much as we can in this early phase of limited allocation of vaccine and uh, need to try to protect the population as much as possible. Thank you. Up next we have Eric at the Times Argus. Yes, this is also for Dr. Levine. Uh, when the Springfield Hospital news broke, you said as of last week, the state had less than 30 uh, vaccines spoiled. Today, you said that there's 99 doses. What caused that spike? I think that's just we have better data and accumulation of data. I'm not aware of uh, like a event that occurred or anything of that sort. Again, I, I don't want to call it a spike. Uh, I agree, it's 69 more doses than 30, but again, in the context of we've received uh, by now 100,000 doses in the state between first and second doses, and we vaccinated over 60,000 people. So um, I don't want to use the word spike for that kind of a change in the data. Are there any common themes with these 99 doses? Were they mishandled? Was it due to people missing appointments, or was it just a variety of factors? Uh, I don't have any insight into that. Uh, does Secretary Smith, do you? No, neither does Secretary Smith. We can uh, probably characterize them uh, and get back to you, because I'm not aware of it at this point in time, though. OK, thank you. Secretary Smith, um, you referenced earlier that a portion of the 1,300 or so uh, extra doses that Vermont received would be set aside for BIPOC Vermonters. How many doses are being set aside for BIPOC Vermonters? Which BIPOC Vermonters are going to be eligible for those, and how are you going to notify them um, and set up some kind of uh, sign-up infrastructure? You know, the health department right now is reaching out uh, to the BIPOC community. As I've mentioned several times, we have a, a very active uh, group within the health department to reach out to the BIPOC community. Um, we have about 320, 300 and some odd uh, people in the BIPOC community that are over 75. Uh, for next week, I think we are allocating about a 
hundred of those extra doses for that BIPOC community in particular. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't go to uh, a registration site or have already uh, lined up for registration, but we have allocated that amount for this special group um, within the health department to reach out with vaccinations to the BIPOC community. So that's where we are. Thank you. I have, um, I think they're both for Secretary Smith. Uh, the first is, uh, if one of you could clarify, uh, you talked about extra um, um, additional uh, vaccine appointments in Bennington, Lamoille, and Orange County. Um, is that, I just want to clarify if that's a result of the extra doses the state is getting, or is that a reflection on um, additional demand in those counties, particularly Bennington County? I was wondering if you could clarify a little bit on that. It's, it's both, Eric. Uh, it's both extra demand and uh, our ability to respond to that extra demand with some extra doses that we're getting. Okay. Um, second uh, related question. Uh, you also mentioned that there was, uh, you're looking for an, an additional, were, you, were I correct in hearing that you said you were looking for an additional vaccination site in the Brattleboro area? No. Um, I, okay. I didn't I say that. that then. Okay. Um, but uh, cause I was wondering, um, we had heard from um, one reader about a situation <clears> that someone in the uh, Guilford Vernon area got a, uh, wound up with a, um, uh, an appointment in Rutland, uh, which is about an hour and a half away from, from uh, south, south what, eastern Vermont. I was wondering if, uh, if there is any consideration to uh, additional uh, an additional site in Brattleboro, or if there's, uh, or whether you know, in a, in a larger picture, just to, you know, we can sort of talk about how uh, area where demand has uh, has been surprising across Vermont, or in areas where demand has geographically been less than you were anticipating, or more than you were anticipating, and how that's affecting uh, how that's affecting the rollout. Yeah, it's been it's been surprisingly equal in in sort of demand, except in the three counties that I, that I had mentioned. Um, you know, we've had thirty two thousand Vermonters, uh, thirty two point five thousand Vermonters uh, sign up. So obviously, um, it, it has rolled out nicely. I was surprised to hear about uh, the person because we do have slots in each sort of geographical area where the person should be able to. We also just to well, let- That was on the first day, that might've been a glitch. I, you know, I, I don't have any, have any more context on that. Okay, let me, let me just also say where we will be partnering with, uh, with hospitals as we roll into the, the next week and weeks after. And I, th I think uh, you will see us partnering with Brattleboro Memorial as well as we move forward. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Andrew, television Yep, hi there, thank you very much. Uh, question from a reader who's 64 and a half uh, years old. They're wondering what their, um, uh, what their grouping looks like. Is there going to be a 60 to 65 age band or will they be um, vying with 20 and 30 year olds for appointments when their turn comes up? Yeah, that's yet to be determined. Uh, we want to get through the uh, age banding from 65 and over due to the, the data that we know exists and then go from there. I mean, uh, obviously after that population, we would said we want to get to those with health conditions uh, that, uh, that are, who are at risk. Um, so, uh, but we haven't determined what the, the next step will be. So I don't have a, a good answer. Um, uh, if he's 64 and a half at this point, this one individual reader, uh, he might get to uh, 65 and would automatically be qualified uh, at that point because we don't close uh, any of those sectors out uh, in the future. Okay. Uh, and then a uh, second question. Um, uh, how many uh, doses were administered each day uh, uh, 
uh, with the 75 bracket so far, and what are the uh, appointment totals um, expected for next week? Yeah, I, you have that, Secretary Smith. I think it's like 1,500, but. I've got some of the data. Um, I don't have the data for the appointments for next week, but I do have some of the data. Um, Wednesday and Thursday, we did uh, 2,500 and one, um, and on today, we have a uh, 1,105 scheduled to be vaccinated for a total of 3,606 uh, for the for the three days. And do you uh, so do you expect next week's pace to be yes. similar to that? Or no, it, it it will start and then, it will start increasing. And uh, can you clarify? It, it seemed uh, earlier in the press conference you indicated that you're now looking at this first five weeks for initial doses, not not to get through the bulk of of uh, both doses. Is that correct? Yeah, I want to. I just want to clarify that because you, you and I had this discussion last time at the press conference. We look at first doses because that means new people that we can vaccinate. We have an allotment that comes in from the federal government that takes care of the second dose, but we look at uh, first dose. So when we move from phase to phase, we're talking about first dose. So five weeks out from now, we expect that we'll be moving into vaccinating the next phase based upon the fact that we won't have any more people to give first dose to. We will have people giving second dose, but we won't have any more people giving first dose. And we do have a reserve. Uh, I don't want to call it a reserve. We do have a pipeline that comes in for second dose. Um, I did, as I mentioned last time, there will be a bulk of people that will be through their second dose on this um, on this uh, five week period. So there will be a bulk of people that will have both first and second dose done uh, during this period. But but if we look at first dose because it's it's the way that we estimate how many new people we can vaccinate. So if, if uh, you get through a, a month here of first doses uh, and then people become due for their second doses and you're going to carry on with uh, the same pace of first doses, do you need to dramatically increase uh, clinic capacity in terms of uh, space and personnel um, because you'll be administering first doses and second doses simultaneously once you're about a month out? And, and do you have the staffing and, and the space for that? We've already calculated that, and yes, uh, we calculated uh, at the beginning how many staff capacity uh, would be needed for both first dose, and then when the second dose and first dose are being administered at the same time. Okay, thank you. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yeah, I'm, he I'm here. Um, I've got a couple for the doctor, if I may. Um, Dr. Levine, have we, uh, have you got um, any new directives uh, uh, from the new administration about lowering or standardizing uh, the PCR cycles, I know our lab range from 32 to 37. Um, have, have you got any new directives to, to lower or standardize the cycles, number one? <clears throat> so number one, I, I've had no new directives from anyone in the federal government, including the CDC, regarding even using that cycles in our reporting. And I've received... Um, Further communication from the um, Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists and the National Association of Public Health Labs specifically, uh, uh, even more strongly arguing against using those values. So that, that's the answer to your first question. So you mean standardizing them higher or standardizing them lower or both? Uh, I was specifically referring to not using them in the reporting of the positive value. 
but no directive I on think. no directive on what you just said either on standardizing in any direction. I see. And most of okay. that would Number also come two. from the FDA, and the FDA has not uh, indicated either. Okay, great. Um, and, and number two, uh, we had a, a, I guess there was a directive from the uh, from the White House um, that uh, nobody was to uh, to mention um, the virus or call it the China virus, um, but yet there seems to be no problem with calling the variants the South African variant and the UK variant. Uh, is is it? Isn't it kind of weird to just kind of like discriminate uh, against the country of origin uh, versus countries of variants? You know, I hadn't thought about it, but you, you raise an interesting point. Um, I think, you know, calling it the China virus was criticized mainly because of the implications it had for people of Asian descent who actually live in the United States and some of the stigma that that created. Uh, so I think that was the initial layer of concern long ago and early in the pandemic. Um, but the point you raise, um, I think we should think about that uh, the variants now that they're being identified do come from parts of the world and they're being called out. I think as long as again we approach it maturely and realize that's just our way of calling a variant a variant and it has nothing to do with uh, never wanting to be in a room with somebody who came from the UK or from South Africa, uh, that would be fine. Um, so I think, you know, scientifically, we usually call these variants by letters and numbers, and that would probably be the better way to go about it. Then it would eliminate all opportunities for stigmatizing people who happen to come from those parts of the world. Yeah, but um, with with other viruses like Marburg and Ebola, uh, they were specifically named, um, and and we knew uh, with the other viruses, we knew the host or we knew where it came from within a within like a month of uh, of uh, you know of finding um, th this virus. Uh, it's been over a year now, and we still don't know. Uh, where this uh, where this came from, whether it was bats or pangolins or a lab accident, um, do you have any idea why it's been over a year and we still don't know where this came from? Yeah, I think part of it is it, it was only I think two weeks ago that the team from the WHO was allowed into China to start to do some of the legwork surrounding that, and they've just been let out of quarantine because they had a mandatory two-week quarantine when they arrived in China. So uh, even though China's been pretty transparent about the genome and all of that, uh, th this team is just starting its good work. So um, I think that tells you something about why we may not have as much information. Um, and my last comment will just be, for years now, we've been very comfortable talking about the flu, and this year it's the H1N1, next year it's the H3N2, or what have you. Uh, so we could get used to doing that with coronavirus, too. Thanks. We have to move to our last well, let's hope we don't have to. Thank you very much. Devin, Local 22. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Um, so my question is kind of picking up on that uh, mental health conversation from earlier among students. Um, Governor Scott, you had mentioned that the conversations are progressing when it comes to getting people back into schools by the end of the school year. I was wondering um, if you could kind of shed a little bit more light on how that's developed um, since making that announcement and um, if there's been anything done to address some of teachers' concerns and trying to get everybody on the same page when it comes to getting back in the classroom? Yeah, um, we are having the conversations. Uh, there is a group uh, working, they, they meet weekly. Uh, Secretary French is on the line and could describe some of that. Um, but I, uh, again, I think that we all agree uh, with the goal. And it's how we get there is going to be the question. Uh, but we have some time um, before we, we get to that point. Um, but I think that they've been uh, worthwhile, the conversations thus far. So 
Uh, Secretary French, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, thank you, Governor. I, I think I would emphasize the point that um, we do have the luxury of time to a certain extent, um, you know, based on the hard work uh, that folks have put in. Uh, I think we feel that there's an opportunity to do some planning as we sort of pivot the system uh, towards a recovery phase. So I think our, our planning is in two, two tracks at the moment. On the one hand, uh, we're meeting with stakeholder groups to conceptualize what do we mean by recovery and education. Um, all the things we need to do to consider the impact of the emergency on kids, whether it be their mental health well-being, uh, their academic success, um, or just the re-engagement uh, with them. Uh, so those are emerging as central themes to that work, but we're positioning our districts to really uh, engage in that planning as the weather uh, gets better and as the vaccine takes hold. And the, the other parallel track, as the governor mentioned, is sort of on the larger um, sort of uh, planning initiative about reopening our state and the economy and the central role schools play in that. So uh, we do have some time to do that planning and we're, we're actively involved in that. Um, and as we develop more specificity on that, we'll be sharing it with, uh, with you and other stakeholder groups. That's all I had. Thank you both. All right. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll see you next Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in.